thinking in the right direction for um, the word that we're going to be um, sitting before today. And it is, it is, what is your heritage? What did you inherit from growing up in the family that you grew up in? Um, let me give an example. Mine, my dad loved to take me on road trips. Uh, we would go on long car rides and stop at nearly every museum <laughs> along the way, it felt like. And as a little kid, I did not like that. Now, I can't get enough of going to museums and, and appreciating art, so it, it must have impacted me some way. But, but that's one thing that I inherited from being a whole person. Um, and now I want to invite you to actually stand up if you need to. You haven't stood up in a while. If you don't need to stand up, no worries. But at least turn to somebody near you and tell them one thing that you got out of your family that you grew up in. What'd you get? And so today we're talking about, um, we're going to look at John chapter 8, and it's um, verses 31 through 36, and it's, it's kind of about um, the family of freedom, and we're doing a series on freedom and what it means to be fully free. So um, let me read this passage for us. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And they answered, We are Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we'll be set free? And Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, um, if, so if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Um, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, and yet you are looking for a way to kill me, because you have no room for my word. Let's pray. God, um, thank you for the invitation to be a part of your family. Thank you for the gift of freedom. Help us to discover more of what that looks like in our lives. We love you. Amen. Um, I noticed as Gabe was leading worship, his shoes are still up here. Uh, they went off pretty quick, and, and I don't know if it's to drive the pedals. Like, I know that when I'm driving, sometimes I have to get my shoes off to, to feel like I'm really driving. Or if it was just um, being before God, we take off our shoes sometimes because we realize that God is bigger and more powerful than we initially imagined. Um, that has been my experience going before this text this week. As John and I were coming up with the series, we kind of thought through Bible texts that had to do with freedom that we would love to preach on, and I was like, oh, that one's perfect. If the sun sets you free, then you're free indeed. What better news than that? That should be like made into t-shirts and mugs. Like, that's super cool. I want to preach that one. And then, as I got into it, I realized Jesus is a salty fellow. <laughs> he has strong words that um, can shake us a little bit. And um, oftentimes sermons end up sounding like uh, the tone of the passage. I think that's actually a good test of a sermon. If it's um, Jesus saying a hard word and we get sweet comfiness out of it, um, it may not be in line. And so um, this, this word from Jesus and this dialogue... Uh, was, was a harder one for me. It's not a tone I usually use. Um, but we're going to go do it anyway. So, um, he starts with, with a conditional statement. If, if you hold to my teachings, um, then you're my disciples. Then you'll discover truth. And then you'll experience freedom. That's, that's the process that he gives. And um, we call someone a Christian... The definition of being a Christian is the accepting Jesus as, as a Savior. He, he gave his life for us. He laid down his entire life and bought us um, forgiveness. <coughs> we can be a part of the family of God without needing to worry about whether or not we earned our way in or somehow kept all the rules or somehow did everything right. It's, it's an incredible gift to be brought into a family, to be adopted in as a part of the family of God. Um, the other part of that that when you become a Christian, it's also turning over our life to God and saying, you're my Lord. I'm going to put you in charge because I have not done this all that well myself, and I, I can't be in charge of it anymore. And Jesus is talking to a bunch of uh, folks who have decided, yeah, Jesus is the real deal. He's the real deal. We, we affirm that Jesus is the real deal. And then he turns to them, and he says, well, uh, 
if you're my disciples, you'll, you'll follow my teachings. Um, and that was a hard thing for the Jewish people because they followed the teachings of Abraham. They had all the rules about how to make God happy. And if they follow all the rules, then God would be happy with them. And here Jesus is saying, follow me. But if you do this, you will experience truth. And you'll experience freedom. Uh, it's a very experiential thing. And I know that when I came to faith, I thought it was um, an intellectual thing in a lot of ways. Maybe I'm an intellectual guy, but it was an intellectual thing where I go, oh, yeah, Jesus is the Lord and, and the Savior. And then something happened the day that I read the book of John, and all of a sudden I was a part of the story. And it got all of me. And that changed me. Started changing me. A little illustration of, of something similar to what Jesus is saying is, um, at one point I bought a exercise bike. How many of you have had exercise equipment in your home? You know, it'll, it'll make it easier. If it's in your house, you don't have an excuse for why you don't go to the gym. And honestly, you can just exercise anytime you want then, right? Um, you don't even have to get dressed up for it. You can like come home in your work clothes, and if you're really mad, you can just work out in your work clothes. Why not? Um, so I had great visions of this. I, I, I pictured myself sitting on my bike watching movies. I put it in the TV room so I could watch movies, and I would pedal the whole time and get 90 minutes worth of working out for somebody who hardly works out at all. And at first, um, there was a flurry of activity. And I felt renewed energy. I, I started losing weight. I was, I was even strong. I was stronger in my lungs, stronger in my legs. Um, and then gradually that seemed to whittle down to the exercise bike being mostly a coat rack. Um, and really awkward in the TV room. Um, and I still would have said, well, yeah, I have an exercise bike. I'm an exercise biker. Um, but I didn't really do exercise biking, and for some odd reason I didn't experience the benefits of riding on said bike. Um, and what does that look like with Jesus when he goes, follow my teachings and you'll experience freedom? Um, I think most people in the world would agree that Jesus had significant things to say, that he um, had great teachings, his moral character is amazing, and um, Yet, that doesn't always translate into fully living and being free. Um, and I think therein lies the rub. Now Jesus is saying, if we want to experience freedom, we hold to his teachings, and then we do. But doing that is a lot harder. Um, one example of that is, is Jesus says, love your enemies, uh, and forgive them, and pray for them, and serve them. Oh, really, Jesus? <laughs> that is not very comfortable. Um, and yet, when we end up in a relationship that's rough with somebody, when we're having a hard time with somebody, the actual process of not holding that against them, and probably having to do that again and again, of uh, releasing that, of, of praying for what's best for them, of seeking what's best for them, um, it does exactly that. It sets us free. We no longer have to carry that baggage that we were carrying. and no longer weighs us down. I'm a snowboarder. It's almost winter. I cannot wait. Um, I'm not a very good snowboarder. So if you want to go snowboarding with me, just don't expect a lot. But I would love to go with you because it's fun. Um, snowboards are, are interesting. I started off skiing. And... Um, and I did that for years. And with skis, you could go down really narrow pathways and go into the woods and find little trails, and, and, and it's very beautiful. With snowboards, in order to slow down, you have to turn the whole thing. And they're kind of big. Um, and so you're turning the whole thing, and you make these giant swaths on the snow, and it wipes out all the moguls that all the skiers love. And um, But when you're snowboarding, if you put me on a very narrow trail, on a snowboard, it gets dangerous. I can't slow down. I can maybe avoid hitting the things on either side for a while, but I'm going faster and faster. And if I try to slow down, it gets more and more dangerous, and then I crash into things. Um, and that's painful 
in lots of different ways. So um, I don't like narrow small runs. Um, but if you put me on a wide one, on a nice giant space where I can go wherever I want to go and I can see whatever I want to see, it, it's absolutely beautiful and breathtaking and, it, and it's awe-inspiring to me. It's a place I definitely connect with God. Um, this is what Jesus is talking about when he describes freedom. Wide open spaces. When we experience freedom, instead of it being trying to do everything that Jesus said and do it right, what happens is we begin to get this experience of there's more space. I'm no longer constrained by my frustration and anger and resentment of that person. Or I'm no longer constrained by my needing to prove something to somebody. I can just be humble and know that God loves me and that's enough. Well, there's wide open space now for me to be me. Um, Jesus is offering us an experience. An experience where we encounter freedom. And the way we encounter freedom is we encounter truth. Truth is a rare commodity. I feel like it's a rare commodity in the world. Um, people who are incredibly honest with each other and just real, that's a beautiful thing. <coughs> and um, so much of the world is sort of like photoshopped, like advertising. If I use this toothpaste, I'm going to be really impressive. That's weird. <laughs> right? Isn't that a little bit weird to you? Um, or even the concept of like making a first impression. There's this idea that they're only going to see a little bit of me, so I better make sure that they see the best part of me. And then maybe later on down the road, way, way, way down the road, maybe then they can see the other sides of me. Um, that takes a lot of work. Or uh, in politics, optics. Oh, the optics are bad on this. You don't want to be seen at this gathering. Um, but, but yeah, you're, you're at, a, at a children's hospital with a little kid. Well, we've got to get photographs of that because that will help shape this image. It'll create an image of something that may not be the whole picture. Um, I remember having a lunch forever ago with Gabriel, actually. And we were talking about Vegas. <coughs> And Vegas has lots of sites that you can find around the world all on like a couple blocks. That's kind of cool. Um, but they're not real. So um, Christina and I went to Italy. We got to take a trip to Italy and I'm Italian. So that was a big deal for me. That was like on my bucket list to get that done. And we went there and one of the things that we saw was Trevi Fountain and, and that uh, it's a, it's a beautiful fountain in, in Rome, and then we went to go see um, Venice as well, and we got to see the canals and the gondolas, and we didn't ride them one. They're expensive, man. <laughs> but they were kind of cool to just walk alongside one and pretend that we were in the boat or something. <laughs> Gaze longingly at the people who were in the boat. Um, but when you go to Vegas, you can do those things. You can find Trevi Fountain. It's actually at Caesar's Palace. And I was so excited to go visit my brother in Vegas because I was going to go see Trevi Fountain and it would be like reliving my trip to Italy. It's not. <laughs> it's like a quarter of the size. It's perfect. It's not even dirty or anything. And then uh, the, the canals, they were like... Yeah, I guess they had gondoliers who would sing, but all the boats were in perfect condition. There was no smell. The water's all chlorinated. You could see right down the bottom. You can't do that in Venice. It stays there. But that's part of the charm. <laughs> and the buildings are like hundreds of years old. And in Vegas, they're like facades that are made to look hundreds of years old, but they're not. Um, it just feels fake. It's, it's a distortion. But when the truth comes into a distortion, all sorts of freedom happens. Have you ever had a misunderstanding with somebody close to you? My guess is all of us can say yes. Um, these happen on a regular basis. I will uh, say something to Christina that I mean perfectly well, like I'm just trying to inform you about something. And, um, and, and it's not received as informing her about something. It's, it's received as me attacking, perhaps. And then, and then uh, she will get defensive, and I'll be like, why are you attacking me for trying to help you? 
Because I'm, I'm slow, man. <laughs> I mean, really, let's interpret that story. I'm a little bit slow. And, um, and then at some point, we go, let's stop the craziness. I love you. And I just wanted to be helpful. And Christina will say, well, I love you too. And I didn't understand why you were attacking me. And, and everything is good, but truth came in. And everything's on the table, and now it's clear space. And when the clear space is there, there's freedom to get started again. We're no longer stuck. And Jesus offers us truth. It isn't always pretty. Um, sometimes it hurts, but it lets us start forward with some clarity. You ever go to a carnival and see those weird mirrors? The distortion mirrors, like the hall of mirrors or whatever? And there's like the mirror you walk up to and it makes you look like you're like three feet tall, but like four feet wide. And then there's the mirror that like makes you look like you're like seven feet tall, but really, really thin. That's the one I like to stand in front of for a really long time. That would be awfully nice. Um, but if all I did was stare at that mirror, um, I would think, man, I should eat more. Um, but then if I go look in a real mirror, and I see things as they are, then I can begin to go, what do I want to do? How do, what would it look like to move forward now? And that's the gift of truth. And when we lean into Jesus' teachings, when we allow him to speak over us what God wants to say, then we find freedom. We find things like, um, your past doesn't define you. The mistakes of the past actually don't have sway over you anymore. You are dearly loved, no matter what sort of story you've had up to this point. Um, we find things like you're made in the image of God. You are incredibly valuable. You are um, an incredible, unique masterpiece designed to do things in the world that only you can do. Right now, there is um, all kinds of stuff going on about uh, not standing up during the national anthem and protest because folks are not feeling like they're being treated equally. They're not being treated equally. Injustice demeans and breaks us down and makes us less than what we're called to be. When we sit before God, what we find is that even though we've had mistakes, we're more than we thought we were. We're more loved and more precious than we thought we were. And those truths empower us to be more. And then we're free to be ourselves. No pretenses, no, impress, no need to impress anybody, no need to cover anything up, just able to be us. There's this term that I keep, that I started to run across and, and um, somebody said it and they said, I feel like when I get healthier, I can, I can speak my truth. It's a strange term. I was like, your truth? I didn't know anybody owned the truth <laughs> per se. And I didn't think anybody got to define the truth. And so I was trying to figure this term out. And I figured out what they meant was, I could say what I want to say without worrying about it. Because before I was intimidated and I didn't feel like I could speak openly. Or I had something to prove or I had a side motive or I had to do something and so I couldn't speak my truth. I couldn't be myself because there was something to get out of it. But when you find like a really great friend who you don't have to hide from, who you don't worry about them retaliating or being angry with you or whatever, and you can finally be yourself, it's incredibly liberating. To be able to sit with somebody for an hour and go, I don't have to be anything except me for now. Man, that's what freedom feels like. And that's what Jesus offers. And Jesus is offering this to these people who have said, yeah, we believe in you. But then there becomes an argument about whose family. Uh, let me read it for us again. Um, they answered him, we're Abraham's descendants. 
and have never been slaves to anybody, how can you say that you're going to set us free? Uh, in becoming a Christian, there's this, this term of being born again in John chapter 3. Uh, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he says, well, you, unless you're born again, you can't enter the kingdom of God. There's this idea of being born again, and in, in John 1, oh man, such a good passage, John 1 um, says this, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children born not of natural descent or of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God, born again. Uh, I became a Christian in late April. I think it was the 28th. I'm not sure of the date anymore because that Bible has since died and gone to its final resting place that had the date in it. But I know that for the first couple of years, my pastor would call me up on that day, and he would go, Happy birthday, Chris. And the first time he did it, I was like, you're crazy. I'm born September 12th. What are you talking about? He said, well, no, you're, 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 you're spiritual birth. When you became a part of the family of God, it's your birthday here. Uh, and then I realized more and more as the years have gone on that that was the day some changes started to take root. And I'm still figuring them out. I'm still getting set free. Um, it's a process. But that's the day that my identity changed as being a part of the family of God. And it's this idea of being part of the family, it, it, it's an incredible idea because a slave in a family or a work person in a family. We're talking about Jesus. He's in Roman culture. The Romans are there. They have um, control over most everything. And there wasn't enough work to do. And so people would work in Roman households. Uh, some people got sold into slavery and became slaves. That was part of Roman culture as well. If you were a slave in the house, you had to prove yourself worth keeping. That's what you did. And when you were there, you were not your own. If the master of the house said, you need to go over here and you need to do this, that's what you did. Um, a son, that, that's different. A son had a totally different life. Um, they were a part of the family, whether they did what they were told to or not. Um, they were their own. They inherited a lot from the family. Think of the story of the prodigal son. That son who goes away, even though he blows everything up. Still the son. The father's still thrilled to see him. Just as much as the son who was out working in the yard and doing what he was supposed to do. A sonship doesn't change. This being born again to God's family, uh, that's who we become. Not something we prove or do. And then we get to know God. Which... I remember talking to this one guy in Arizona when I was doing college ministry there, and he's like, you're absolutely nuts. You know God. Like, we're having discussions about who God is, and, and, and he's like, well, I think God might be like an all-powerful person, but I don't get this whole idea of a personal God. That just feels strange to me. And we were conjecturing and, and thinking about what God might be like, and I'm like, I know God. I talk to him every day. What are you talking about? He's like, you're nuts for saying that. Like, that's what psychotic people say, is that they hear from God and they talk to God. <laughs> Um, knowing God is really, really different than knowing about God. If you know a lot about John Westfall, you can read his books, you can uh, listen to his sermons, you can know his work history, you can know a lot of things about John. I can even tell you some things about John. He's a big personality. He can fill up a room all on his own. Uh, he's an incredibly down-to-earth guy who genuinely cares about Everybody. Um, you can know all that about him, but it's not going to change you. But man, spend a few countless hours with John Westfall, you're not going to be the same. It, it just doesn't work that way. Um, knowing someone changes us. Um, especially knowing someone close. And when God moves into our lives, that's about as close as we get. It'll change us. But there is this weird lie out there 
And it's the lie that these folks have, which is, uh, we're free. We don't need that. We don't need help with freedom. Uh, it's kind of funny that, that this conversation Jesus is having, they go, we're the children of Abraham. We are a very special spot with God. And so how could you say that you're going to set us free? We've never been slaves to anybody. I did a little research. The Jewish people had some slavery in their past. I mean, uh, Egypt for 500 years. They also got enslaved to Babylon. And then when Assyria beat Babylon, they became their slaves. And then Alexander the Great came in and made them slaves. And the Ptolemies after Alexander the Great. And then Syria. Actually, they had 200 years of freedom and 3,500 years of national history. That means most of the time they were slaves. Uh, so who is Jesus to offer freedom? I don't know if we're all that different. I don't think we always see the chains, but I don't think we're fully free either without Jesus' help, and we're not there yet. Um, well, we like to think that we're free. Little mini illustration that occurred to me. Uh, I know this guy. Um, I've been hanging around a lot of addicts lately, by the way, just because we have connections with AA and stuff, so I'm getting to know people. I know this guy. And he gets up in the morning and um, he literally cannot function until he gets his special drink. And he, and he, he, he has to in, infuse this drink, soak it, and then, and then he can finally drink it and then he can finally function or else he's really, really angry and really, really cranky and he, and he can't think straight. Um, you don't want to talk to him before that first drink. Um, and that person's me and it, yeah, it's coffee. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, but seriously, put me on a coffee free plan and I'm in trouble. Um, we need freedom in all sorts of places. In, in coffee, I can accept some slavery to coffee. It, it tastes really good, so I don't mind eating that first cup. Um, but the rest of life, I don't want to be enslaved, man. I don't want to keep doing the same patterns that some of the ones I learned in my family that aren't helping me. Um, I'm really good at accommodating. Our family was really good at keeping the peace. Not always the most healthiest way to do it, though learning other ways. Um, that's one of the places I'm getting pushed on in freedom. Um, if we want to be more free, it seems to me finding our identity in our family is a good start. Like, Growing up, I was a really independent kid, and I would find other families to sort of like, oh, I like these people. I'll pretend I'm one of their kids. And they'd be like, all right, you can come have dinner here. <laughs> and um, it was kind of whoever my best friends were. But uh, along the way, I got impacted by those families, especially if I hung around them a long period of time. And, and it was a really, really good thing. So the question is, what family do we want to be a part of? Because it's going to make a difference. And Jesus says there's a couple families. There's, there's the family of uh, sin where we get enslaved more and more. And it, it's one of the great ironies uh, of freedom. We think that doing what we want is freedom. And yet if we do what we want all the time and we go, God, I, I don't really need your help with this. I've got this. We will find ourselves enslaved. Um, but if we go, man, I'm a part of God's family. What would that look like to live in that? Then we begin to get more free. And, and this family thing is, it, it shapes our lives. You all probably didn't have a hard time figuring out what you inherited from your family. Or if we really had an hour long conversation, you could tell me all sorts of things that your family did uh, for you and, and to you. So, what would it look like if God were to do for us and to us and shape our lives? It's a beautiful thing. Christina and I went, uh, I mean, I, I feel like I bring this up every week. We go to counseling every now and again. Um, at one point, she was doing a bunch of stuff that to me was absolutely crazy. I'm like, why are you doing this? This doesn't make any sense. 
Like that's not how you do life. And she was saying the same thing of me. So we decided to go see this guy who, uh, um, and then we had no clue what he did. He was just a friend of ours and, and, and he did family of origin counseling. So he sat us down and we worked through like, what did it look like for us to grow up? Who did we have around us and how did that <laughs> shape us? And all of a sudden, what I thought was crazy about Christina made a ton of sense and what she thought was crazy about me began to make some sense. So, um, but the family shapes us. The environment shapes us. And Jesus' words and the environment of being here in this space worshiping with you all, being a part of the family of God and experiencing that together, praying for the world and being prayed for by you, shapes me and shapes me in really beautiful ways. And that's the gift that God gives. So, what area do we want to be more free? In that area, begin to explore what God might have to say. And then just try to live it out. <coughs> Hold through the teaching and see what happens. It's, it's designed to be experienced. Um, it's not designed just to be talked about. And it, it's true. Um, I'm not great at it. But there's some things that, that I've attempted. And um, I know one of the areas that has really impacted me uh, was in, in dealing with money. That for me, um, <clears throat> at some point along the way, I think I was taught about giving, giving to God and, and giving some of my finances back to God and seeing, seeing that perspective of God has given me everything and so I'm going to give some back to him. And that, um, God was my co-partner in providing for me. That's a cool thought. I was like, that's a cool thought. I'm going to run with that one. I'm going to do something about that. So I began to do something about that. And, and then um, I realized how tight I cling to stuff. And I began to work the muscles and to experience the freedom that came with going, God provides. And I'm going to trust him to do that. And, and, and for me, it was actually little tiny steps of like, Man, that waiter didn't bring me my food as fast as I thought he should. I'm going to tip him anyway. What? Maybe even a tiny bit more. Um, <coughs> generosity began to creep in, and I began to hold things loosely. And then I remember I had a hard, hard time at a church. I had a hard time at a church. Um, I didn't deal with it well. And um, I was mad at God. I was mad at church, and I stopped going. And I instantly stopped giving to said church. And, um, and that's when Christina knew something was seriously wrong. She's like, oh, he stopped giving to the church. Now what do we do? Um, and and I, I was shipwrecking in my faith. And um, she said, we have to give somewhere then. You, know, you don't have to give to that church, but we have to give somewhere because God gave us this. And we have to give it back to God. So you got to figure this out. So I was like, fine, give it to Food Lifeline or something. Um, so mad. Um, here's the interesting thing that happened in that process. I found myself getting less free. I found myself getting more worried. I found myself thinking that I had all the responsibility and it was all on me to manage all the finances and that God was not a part of that story. And the second that God got taken out of the process, I found myself enslaved. I can only assume that in other areas, whatever area, work, family, friends, enemies, humility and pride, all those areas that it's the same. If I lean in and I do it with God, I'm going to find myself more free. And if I don't, I'm going to find myself enslaved. That's the choice. So, we've already affirmed that Jesus is something special. Now we get the option of choosing life. Choose to walk with him. Choose to be fully free. To be his disciples. Um, and to see what that looks like this week. You think we can do that together? Mm -hmm. Alright. Let's do it. Let's pray. God, we need your help with this. Um, 
we are so good at being independent. And we're so good at, at, at not wanting your help with things. And yet we need your help with things. That's when we get fully free. Thanks for inviting us to be a part of your family. Thanks for giving us a new life. Thanks for loving us enough to lay down your life for us. And then loving us enough to keep us moving forward into better and better places. I can't wait to see what those are, and I can't wait to see where you bring each of these people here. Help us to do that this week and in the months to come. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen.